Are you ready to take your real estate investing business to the next level? Next level. Well, you're in the right place. This is the Real Estate Investing Morning Show with your hosts, Wayne and Gabby. Good morning and welcome to the Real Estate Investing Morning Show. Today is Thursday, May 16th, 2024. The weather today will be a high of 11 degrees in Edmonton. 19 degrees in Calgary, 17 degrees in Vancouver, 18 degrees in Saskatoon, and 20 degrees in Toronto. Thanks, Evie. Good morning, everybody, and thank you so much for being here. Uh, Thank you so much for being part of the live show. I see everybody coming in a little slowly this morning, but it's totally okay. Um, This is the place you want to be if you want to get free coaching for real estate investing. Uh, All you need to do is just download an app called Podbean, P-O-D-B-E-A-N, and search up the Real Estate Investing Morning Show. And then uh, join in at 6 a.m. at Mountain Time every morning, weekday morning. And uh, you can join in live with us and ask any questions you want about real estate investing, and we will answer them for free. We provide free coaching for real estate investors. We love doing it. Uh, And this is your cue, guys, if you guys are in the live show. This is your cue to put your questions in the chat and let us know what you want answered today so we can get you those answers. You can take action and get you closer to your goals. Sound good? Sounds good. All right, all right. Cool. Um, nothing, I uh, don't have anything on our list of the questions that we have an answer. We had a, an amazing guest yesterday, mm-hmm. Natherine Legere from Calgary, gave us a Calgary real estate market update, which was fantastic. Absolutely. Did And did we have any leftover questions from the day before? I don't think so. No. Okay. So we're all caught up. I also reset my computer and uh, how many of you guys can relate to this? I don't know. Maybe. But I, I have two separate windows that I keep open. One is like personal stuff that I just like all of my windows, just things that I like to check up on. And then my other window is my... Um, my business stuff. So it'll be all 12 of my tabs. 10 of those are business emails. Um, and, and the other two are like for the podcast and some other stuff. 12 is actually not even close. It's probably like 23. Um, but then whenever my computer needs to reset and sometimes it just resets on its own, it just fucking everything closes. And then I get up in the morning and I turn the computer to, uh, to get everything all set up for the podcast. I'm like, uh, nothing's where it's supposed to be. And, uh, Microsoft Word is where I keep all my questions as well. So Microsoft Word was shut down. And anyways, so if you had questions, I lost them. Long story short. Total bummer. I think that there's... Um, I don't think there was, though. I think that there's uh, two types of people. And, you know, I'm I'm sure that certain people will relate to you about having a million tabs open. But um, you are all psychopaths. Just a little bit psycho. Like, just that's it. I don't know. I think for like a normal person, and I don't know, maybe maybe you guys who are here with us today can all prove me wrong. But I think normal people, I think I'm pretty normal. Um, you know, you might have a few tabs open during the day, but you know, they get shut down. Like that's just that's just messy. That's too much noise. You're just not on my level, Gab. <laughs> There's just so many different things that I do and I just need them all open in order to access them quickly. And I almost find that as well, it's it's almost like my um, it's almost like my my reminder to also check on all these things. So, like, I once the podcast is done, like, I have my routine of like twenty things that I have to do that I do for the next four hours after the show. I try and get as much work, try and get as much work done as possible. Sorry, just the spider just came down, and just like landed right in front of me while I was talking, and I was. Can you? If you were you curious must be about so, the awkward pauses. <laughs> You'd be so proud of how calm I stayed and just continued saying what I like, just talking. But like now, like the spider webs in my hair. Anyways, that was the weirdest fucking thing ever. Um, sorry, what I was saying was after the show, um, I got like my four hour, three to four hour routine of things that I have to do for business. And I try and get as much work done as possible um, right after the show. And then I go have breakfast and I get ready and, and I got the afternoon to myself. Or afternoon worth of calls. So um, it's just part of my routine. And that all those 23 tabs are just the 23 tabs I need to go through. I need to go through all those business emails to see one business at a time, which things need to be responded to, right? 
rather than just like all over the place. Because if I open up my phone, oh God, dear God, it's just absolute madness. That's crazy. You think you think my tabs are crazy. My phone is littered with 4,000 notifications and it's all over the place. It's hard to stay organized, hard to finish one task at a time. So by going through all my tabs, I'm able to go through business by business. The emails need to be responded to. Star the ones that I don't want to deal with today <laughs> and that I'll deal with tomorrow or later. Write down all my notes, brain dump into my notepad, and then hopefully get some stuff done today and relax in the afternoon. It's um, it's what it's what they call financial freedom. <laughs> Fuck, there's no freedom. It it sure is nice though. I mean, it's it's. I'd rather be doing this than I'm a than, slave to my tabs. <laughs> <laughs> I'd, I'd rather be doing this than climbing ladders and squeezing my ass into manhole covers and, and, and into vessels and <sighs> crawl around on my knees all day. And you know what I mean? And smelling like a, like a butthole. <laughs> Where are my trades workers at? <laughs> um, YYC <laughs> Investor says, currently have 92 tabs on my iPhone. Yeah, phone phone's a different oh, thing. Oh, there's... yeah. Yeah, because like that yeah. is ridiculous, and I don't know why that's different for me. Because like yeah, I I mean I actually just checked right now while while Wayne was talking to see how many I had, and I just cleared them up recently, so I only have eleven. But that's um that would be normal for me to have like yeah a hundred. <laughs> oh my god, Wayne has two hundred and fifty four tabs on his iPhone right now. <laughs> yeah, he's a psycho. Uh, it's one of those things you're like, oh, I better leave that open because one of these yeah. days I'm going to want to read that article. Yeah. <laughs> and then you get a new iPhone and then it's like it's all gone. Most of mine are like recipes that I don't want to forget about or like. What? <laughs> yeah. Oh, my God. It's okay. So I'm not I'm not alone on this one? No, you're not alone. But you're still a psychopath. Okay. Yeah. I hope that it also gave um, listeners a little. We're, we're pretty open and transparent. Uh, I like I like being real. I like being raw so people can see what you know, what their life could be like. <laughs> <laughs> oh God. Um, and, and what, what the life of most full-time real estate investors are like, it's, it's not glitz and glamor. It's they, they sure love to sh pretend like it is, but it's not, it's just pretty normal life. We got to, you know, a kid, we got to take her to school. We got to pick her up. There's a certain amount of hours during the day that we can get stuff done. Um, we like you, you know, struggle with trying to find the time to eat right and exercise and get active and, and fit all of it into a day, you know, on top of, you know, kids activities and then trying to be, you know, find some time for ourselves as well. Just, we all have the same amount of hours in the day and we all have our same uh, more or less obligations. Um, but I, but I like kind of sharing, you know, my routine, just people can get a bit of an it better insider look as to, to what to expect. I also want people to realize that like, that it, that it is very normal. Like it's not, you think that it's going to be something extravagant. You think you're going to be flying down to, to see the next play and then maybe you're going to be, you know, going off to all the, you know, Lear jets and stuff and you're going to be uh, six months vacation or six months living in this country and stuff but no it, it, does, it doesn't work like that I, I try and get people that realization as quickly as possible if you've got kids you're not traveling as much as you want to trust me i fucking love taking weeks and off i love taking vacations now ever since i did my first one i've been fucking hooked and now that i got the money to go whenever i want i fucking love it like i'm always constantly thinking i'm like can we just go away for a week but you can't when you've got kids. You can't. Like the school doesn't like it. The school doesn't like when we take her out, you know, of school for extended weekends and stuff like that. They, they don't like when you do two-week vacations in the middle of the school year. Like we've gotten emails saying like, oh, she's her attendance has been a little, right? Because on top of, you know, us taking her out and whatnot for her vacations and whatnot. At the same time, she's, like, she's a kid. She's sick every other week <laughs> for like four day stretches. So I got to make sure the kid's actually in school and learning something. And school doesn't like it. So there is limitations. So we, you know, I think we got it down now to like vacations. We do one in December, one in like Feb, March, and one in July. That's, that's as much as I can squeeze in. Oh, spring break. But that's like March, right? 
Yeah. Yeah. Three. That's all I can do. Three. I wish I could. I, like, for my life, I don't leave the house very much, except unless I absolutely need to be somewhere. But like most of my stuff's over Zoom. So like I could literally, I could literally run my business from wherever the hell I want. And yet here I am in my house, um, you know, in Edmonton, Alberta. <laughs> Uh, so I, I just want people to realize that is that, you know, everything that you're working for this, 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 I'm going to work my ass off 12 hours a day and stay up till midnight, analyzing deals and getting joint venture partners and stuff. Your life's not going to be that much different. But once you come to that realization, I'm not trying to like make people sad. I'm not trying to depress people. What I'm trying to get people is to the realization that your life will not be all that different. And therefore you need to really, truly have a good grip and grasp on what it is that you truly appreciate most in life. What are the things that are really the most important to you? So that way you can, you don't get to this, this moment where you're like, Oh my God, my life isn't that different. Why didn't I just stay, you know, as a pipe fitter? Why didn't I just stay as a chiropractor? Why didn't I just, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And there are things in life that actually truly fulfill us that maybe we take for granted. And through this exercise and through this, um, this this journey of understanding what you'll realize is that a lot of the things that fulfill you you already have and you have access to them right now this is a weird cycle that people go through this is a realization where they're like i need all of this i need all this money i need to have this freedom so i don't have to work anymore so i can do all the things i want to do and then you realize all those things you want to do you don't really get to do that very much and then you realize that they're not all that important and then you come to the realization that the things that are most important to you are right in front of you and you can you can cherish them and you can value them right now, but you choose not to because you think it's all attached to money. Um, I posted about fucking geocaching. <laughs> Got a bunch of people messaging me. We're like, oh, I love geocaching. That's so cool. Um, so I'm just trying to find ways to like connect with my kid because my kid's just constantly growing, not growing, but like, She's getting older and she's turning into a new person. So I have to find new ways to connect with my kid. Um, Cause they, 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 they fucking change. They turn into new people every six months and the, the cool, funny things that used to do before or the fun things like, you know, aren't fun anymore for them. They're constantly always changing. And so I'm like, this would be really cool. This is a great way for the family to connect. And uh, we're going to go out and we're going to explore and try and find these little uh, geocache things. And it's been a lot of fun. I've, I've enjoyed it. And, um, it's a little annoying because the kid is a kid, you know. Ow, the branch poked me. <laughs> but um, <laughs> it's fucking hilarious. This is actually a funny story. I wasn't planning on telling it. But uh, um, so last night, a kid's like, spin me, spin me. When we're walking. So we, we're, we're at some park and we're, we're walking around. And um, and we're going back to the vehicle. I'm going to take her out for ice cream. And... Uh, She's like, spin me, spin me. And I'm like, this is not something I hear from my nine-year-old kid very often. But I'm like, okay, fine. I picked her up and I just spun around as fast as I could. And uh, I got back to the vehicle like two minutes later and there's a real estate investor in our community. He's like, hey, I just saw you over here and I saw you spinning your kid around. And I'm like, that I must have looked like the greatest dad in the world. Just, you know, they, they drive by Wayne. Oh, my God, there's that guy on the podcast. And there's him just like spinning his daughter around like like it's a Hallmark fucking commercial. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it's like that's that's the stuff that I like doing. It's, it, it, it took me a long time to realize it. And it's taken me an even longer time to 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 teach this to our mentees and our mentorship program that like, hey, guys, quit chasing the fucking doors, quit chasing the dollars. Like all the stuff that you have and all the stuff that you want and the things that actually truly fulfill you are right in front of you and you don't even fucking realize it. And some of you guys don't even need rental properties. I'll save you a bunch of money and a bunch of time. Just go spend some time with your fucking kids and stop spending all your evenings, you know, hunting for these fucking properties that mean zero value in your life. Stop wasting months of months of your time trying to get a property that's going to make you $70,000 over the next 10 years. Like it's not going to change your fucking life. And it's not going to get you any closer to your kid. It's actually going to get you further from your kid. Mm. Is seventy thousand dollars over the next ten years really going to change your fucking life? But you're willing to spend months away from your kid in order to get it. Like you just like I I know the like I'm not trying to tell all of you guys to stop investing in real estate, but some of you guys need to stop investing in real estate because like 
I get, I, I'm just real with you. I'm convincing you to not like I'm convincing some of you to to stop pursuing real estate investing and just hang out with your kids. When every other person with a podcast is trying to convince you to to join up for their for their twenty thousand dollar program, I'm being real with you. I mean, really, some of you guys don't need to. Some of you guys have all the money that you need and you have great jobs and you could just be spending time with your kids right now. Or you could be, you know, spending time with your your spouse and making kids. Because some people are like, oh, I just, I don't want to have kids till I got my life in order. Mm-hmm. That was me, wasn't it? <laughs> Two years yeah. without having a kid, mm-hmm. because something like that. Mm-hmm. I know a lot of people like that too. They're just like, oh, I know I want to get all my life in order first. I'm like, okay, cool. Whatever. But you could be having some of the best years of your life. Yeah. Anyways, just real talk this morning. Not sure how exactly I got into that, but I'm being fucking real with you guys. Yeah. Um, yesterday I was on the um I was I did a I, I don't I don't know what to really call it. I guess it was a an little interview. bit of an interview, an but it was um, at a meetup, uh, online meetup for the She Builds Wealth community, and uh, with Christine Trainer. And um, I can't remember how the conversation got there, but um, we were talking about how there seems to be, you know, like um, the two different kind of extremes of like the person in real estate who wants to like hustle, 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 get it all done, grow the business, have everything they want now. And then there's the person who's like, I'm not willing to do that. I'm not willing to sacrifice all that time, all that time away from my family, like doing all these things like detrimental to my health, like all those types of things. And so they're like, I'll take the slow, maybe more passive way. Mm -hmm. And there's like those two extremes. And she's saying like, I wish there was like a hybrid, like that there was like some median like in there. And, um, and I, I kind of brought up the fact that I think that, well, you know, like, I think I've been pretty clear whenever I speak about this, that I'm against the hustle culture. I think that it is detrimental to our health. And it, in the, at the end of the day, you end up either sick and miserable, or you've lost people along the way that matter to you. Maybe at the end of your journey, when you finally reach that destination you were going for, maybe like, you know, you're now divorced, you're estranged from your kids. Like, you know what I mean? Like you, you put everything at risk and you, and you lost what mattered to you. And so I was talking about how there's this middle ground, how if we just decided to focus on our, like our health, our well being regulating our nervous systems, taking care of our bodies, getting enough sleep, eating nutritious food, like really taking care of ourselves, that there is this really happy medium where all of a sudden we have a lot more energy to put into, you know, like the amount of work that you can get done in a few hours used to maybe take you a week. You could get the same amount of work done in a few hours that used to take you a week of trying to grind because you were scattered and all over the place and you thought you were hustling, but you weren't being productive. And and it's and in in doing this and me discovering this and me taking this path that I'm talking about this this hybrid, um, I've I have so much more energy to be present with Everly to be present with you Wayne. Like I really feel like my life is turning this like really beautiful point where all of a sudden I can do all the things and it not impact my way of life. You know what I mean? Like I can be quote unquote hustling. But my hustling is only taking me two or three hours in the day where it's taking all of you enormous amounts of time. You're and so you can, I'm yeah. much more productive. And so you can get to your destination way faster and way more productively by just doing self care, <laughs> by just taking care of yourself. Sounds fucking silly, doesn't it? It does. You can't sell that to anybody. Nobody will be like, oh, okay, I'm going to take time to work out and eat healthy and regulate my nervous system. Like, no, nobody's going to buy into that shit. No. You need to hit a rock bottom. (laughs) Yeah. And I, and I hit it and I hit a a kind of health rock bottom. I was feeling like absolute complete shit every day of my life. And I reached a point where I was like, this needs to change. I can't feel like this. Like this can't be my reality for the next however many years of my life. So that was my little bit of a rock bottom where I changed it. But yeah. I, I, I want to continue on with this conversation. There's a few other things we want to cover today, too, as well. Um, I think we're going to talk about a washing machine. <laughs> yes. Um, 
<laughs> and <laughs> and uh, refinancing properties. But this is this is real shit that I think is important. And I want to talk a little bit more about your interview that you did yesterday. Uh, hear about what you guys talked about. And um, if this is resonating with you, just put it in the comments. You know, let us know. Um, but. I just want to say before we take this break that this is stuff that I'm constantly having conversations with, with people that we coach and trying to, like I said, like it took me a long time to, to realize it myself. And it's taken me even longer to get our mentees um, to understand it, that this is the real stuff. And the stuff that we talk about is not, it's not because I love talking about it because trust me, I don't, this is not what I want to be talking about the reason we talk about it and why we we need to talk about it is because this is one of the big reasons that separates the people who succeed, who last and the ones who quit or the ones who just give up. And we've put lots of time and energy and studying into why some do and some don't, why some succeed and some don't. And this is it. This is why we talk about it. So we hopefully we can give you that paradigm shift that, that give you that clarity to understand why it is that, you know, or how it is that you need to set yourself up in order to succeed. So we'll get back into this in just a minute. We'll be right back. It's time to sell your house or buy a new one or an additional one. But where do you start? Do you drive around neighborhoods hoping to spot for sale signs? Do you take a shot in the dark with a real estate listing website? Or do you go with an experienced and focused realtor? Nathareen Legere is the licensed expert realtor you've been hoping you would find. Working in Calgary and surrounding areas, whether you're buying, selling, or investing, Nathareen will help you bridge the gap between you and your real estate goals. Find Nathareen Legere online at houseandhomeyyc.net. Are you just starting to build your real estate portfolio? At Kirkwood & Brennan, we are real estate investors and mortgage brokers who understand real estate investing. Not only do we help you get a mortgage, but we help you build a better real estate portfolio. Check us out at kbmortgages.ca or call 778-847-0552. Take the time now so you have more time later. Well, 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 investors, you're looking for some lucrative off-market opportunities, but all the good deals seem to have dried up on the MLS, what do you do? You go to Legere Homebuyers, a Calgary premium wholesaling company. That's what you do. Whether you're looking for the next fix and flip, buy and hold, burr project, or redevelopment, you'll find the best off-market deals with Legere Homebuyers. And don't worry, Legere does the work for you. Join the buyers list on calgaryoffmarket.ca and edmontonoffmarket.ca today. All right, and we are back, guys. Um, to kind of wrap up that uh, that topic, um, I just want to to circle back to what we were saying a couple days ago. Was it a couple days ago? Friday. No, it was Friday. Um, well, that day that we had Calvin on the show, and we were talking about who's going to be around to have coffee with us in fifteen years. And we're coming up on 15 years pretty soon here that we've been in the industry. And the people that we started with or the people that were, well, I mean, we weren't really part of like the real estate investing community in the beginning Mm -hmm. for the first, I don't know, five or six years. Like we just kind of did our own thing and I did my own research, but Gabby was barely involved. And, um, but like when I started finding like, my quote unquote circle in the real estate or my, my, my community in the real estate investing, you know, industry. Most of those people that I started with or the people that were even that had been around for a little while when I got started, the people that I looked up to, the people that were starting at the same time the you know, most of them aren't here. They're not. And Constantly, sometimes, you know, Gabby and I will just be, into, you know, having conversation in passing and, you know, we'll be like, whatever happened to that person? Whatever happened to that person? And what what mostly happened is they either, you know, burned out, um, they fucked up, or they just quit. They realized it wasn't for them. And it's incredibly sad because, and I say this so often, the amount of stories that I hear from people like you of just why you're doing it, your why. I want to do this for my family. I want to create this. I want to be able to build this. I want to be able to do this for these people. And it's 
it's like I'm I'm on the longest boulevard of broken dreams. Seriously. When you when you stop and think about Gabby, I'm, I'm sure you could think of a million as well of all the people that have connected with us, DM'd you along the way and said, oh my God, I just want to spend a little bit more time with you. Or I want to, like, can I get on a call with you? I just, I, I want to be able to do this. I'm so excited about this. I want to be able to help these people. I'm going to build a business that does this. And it's going to create all these opportunities for this. And all of those dreams are gone. Mm-hmm. Gone. Because people can't get their shit together. Also, I think people aim a little bit too high. Mm-hmm. And they don't realize that they don't need that much. Or they come to the realization that they don't want it that bad because they, they're not spending time with their family anymore. They just, they just don't got their, their poop in a group. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. It's like they're, they're, they go way too hard over here. They leave the other stuff behind. Then they realize that that stuff is more important. So they leave the real estate investing business alone. There's like, fuck this. It's not worth it. I need to spend time with my kids. When they could have been doing it all along. You know what I mean? And actually succeeded. It's just, it seems like a, like it's a massive disorganization of thoughts and priorities and values. And that's, and that's why people fail. They just got the whole, they're looking at it all wrong. Either that or they're being guided by the wrong people. The amount of like shitty information out there. Would an extra $50,000 a month change your life? Like that kind of bullshit. You know what I mean? Where people are like, oh my gosh, yes, absolutely. This, this sounds amazing. I'm going to watch this webinar because I'm going to learn how to make six. If I could make $600,000 this year, I could travel the world and I can homeschool my kids and everything else. And then they go down that little rabbit hole and they find out it's not actually real. And they spend all this time and all this energy and all this money. And then they fail and then they realize that their relationship with their kid is lacking. So they go back and they're like, I'm sorry, honey, I'll never do that ever again. It's just like the it's just like the next diet fad or the next weight loss supplement that people get roped oh into. My God, it's like so they're right. so desperate for for a quick fix or for an easy way that um, they're not willing to just stop and and go vanilla and and do the things that are tried and true. Yeah. So uh, if you guys are finding this boring today, if it's not resonating with you, I apologize. But I think for the one or two people that hear this today and that actually it changes their their, their mindset or their, their view on this, or their, they get that, par- that paradigm shift. Um, I think it's, I think it's a win. I think it's valuable. I think it's worth it. Um, just trying to help. That's all. Yeah. Um, in the comments here, Chris says, I'm joining a bit late today. So I hope this is related. When I started as a landlord, I wanted to tackle all of the maintenance and repairs myself, which sacrificed valuable time with my family. I was also more irritable and exhausted. I ended up networking with other landlords in the city I invest in and found a power team of reputable repair people to do the work for me. The change was night and day. I'm happier, have a lot more energy and spend way more focused time with my family. That's, that's amazing. Yeah. Um, yeah, it is like definitely, definitely, um, related, but I think in a different way where also, you know, like if you are, you know, if you're here and you're doing this business and you're growing the thing, Um, your ability to outsource and to not be the person doing everything all the time is definitely another way to, you know, to, to run a smoother business and to like, I like going back to the regulated nervous system, like not being in charge of everything and having every weight stacked onto your own shoulders um, is definitely a smart way to, to move forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He said it also allowed me to find more deals and scale my real estate investing portfolio. Mm-hmm. That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's all about priority and focus. Focus is the five letters. F O C U S is what everybody needs to be wor- focusing on. <laughs> <laughs> uh, for lack of better words. Uh, That's how important the word is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It's honestly, it's, if anyone asks me, well, you know, what's the best tip that you could give for real estate investors? I would say focus and nothing, nothing more needs to be explained. Yeah. That's it. I mean, I, I probably do need to explain a little bit more because it's probably not a good enough answer for people to actually take it and implement it. Mm-hmm. But the truth is, is that the best tip I can give anybody in this game or entrepreneurship is focus. Just stick to what you're good at. Stick to what you need to do. Just focus in on that and let everybody else do everything else. Yeah. It's uh, uh 
that's an, that's a, one of the other big reasons why we see a lot of people fail is is lack of focus. Oh yeah, just all over the place. And then and then you never get any satisfaction or gratif- grat- uh, gratification out yeah. of anything you do because you never finish it's anything. Like you never finish anything, so you never you never get a win because it's like you quit too soon. Oh, this isn't working. I'm going to try this. Oh, this isn't working. I'm going to try this. Oh, this isn't working. I'm going to try this, and then you quit. Because yep. nothing's working, but you never gave any one of those things any time. Absolutely. Yeah, one hundred percent. Also, Charles in the comments here says, "Totally true." What I have learned, what I have learned, is to learn to delegate, especially running a business. One hundred percent. You cannot do it all. Okay. Um, you see, Elsa says, "Find your own team and focus on growing. Get all the priority done." Love it. Mm-hmm. Okay, I wasn't kidding with you guys. We are going to definitely talk about refinances today. Um, sometimes I just get down this little, you know, I find this little spot and I'm like, oh, I, I really want to go here. Um, it's, it's hard to bring up a topic like this, just, you know, be like, oh, I'm going to talk about this today. You know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. So when I find myself there, I'm going to, I'm going to explore it and I'm going to open it up and I'm going to, I'm going to go full emotion on it and, um, and let you guys know. And, and, and long story short, that's why we went geocaching. <laughs> Family time. <laughs> Appreciate those we love. <laughs> <laughs> and, and for the guy that that texted me last night, now you know why. Now you know why I was spinning my kid on the side of the road. <laughs> I just want to see how far I could throw her. <laughs> side note: um, there was an owl in the tree where one of the um, one of the caches was, which was really freaking cool. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Okay, so. I do want to talk about refinances because uh, we're in the process of doing some refinances. And um, actually, to be honest, I might be doing quite a few um, because we have, with every change in the real estate cycle, as we talk about, uh, new opportunities are created and um, and added uh, that we can take advantage of. And when we are in a rising market, and when rents are starting to go up, it's a really good time to explore potential refinances because um, we have the equity there and we have the rent to support it. And I see a question here. What are you planning on doing with interest rates on the refi? And this that, that is something that we do need to take into consideration. Um, we have some, we have some, uh, some fixed mortgage terms uh, coming up for renewal, which is a really good time for refinances because you you don't want to refinance a property or add a HELOC if you're going to have to pay early termination penalties, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, And as I mentioned before, obviously the the other big thing is the fact that with the appreciation, you know, adding value, uh, the value of the property increasing means that a lot of new equity is there that wasn't there before. And some, most of these properties, we've just built up lots of equity over the last however many years, depending on the property. Uh, one of these properties, though, is actually a property that we bought last year that we're going to yeah. be refinancing. Pretty and cool. <laughs> and this is not something very common for the Alberta market or Edmonton. Um, this doesn't happen very often. Normally, we're a slow and steady, you know, hold it for long term, you know, nothing exciting. Um, for those of you guys that are in uh, the Ontario region who have been refinancing properties 14 times over the last 10 years, you're like, oh, it's nothing. I do it every birthday. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I get it, but, uh, I also know a lot of people uh, that, that have failed because of that. So, um, I want to be very cautious with the way that I explain this. Cause I don't want people like over leveraging themselves. I don't want people like over leveraging their properties and setting themselves up for failure. Like many have in previous years, when you're approaching a refinance, when you're thinking about pulling some of your equity out for reinvestment or for paying back your partners, you need to take serious caution and consideration to make sure that you're not adding additional risk on. Because when you do refinance a property, you are, in most cases, you know, increasing your mortgage payments and decreasing your cash flow. And by decreasing your cash flow, what you're doing is you're decreasing your risk mitigator. And your risk mitigator cash flow is what protects you when things don't go as planned. So our cash flow throughout the many years we've been investing has been what's what saved us 
when things don't go as planned, when interest rates go up, when rents go down, when demand goes down with increased vacancies, right? That's what saves our ass and what the reason why many have not made it is because they didn't have that. So if we're going to get a little greedy and pull some of our equity out, we got to take all that into consideration. So I'm going to, I'm going to share a couple different uh, examples of two different stories, or real, real life examples of, of properties that we're going to be refinancing and maybe a couple more if we have time. And I'm going to walk through the considerations that we're taking and making um, to determine whether we should and how this is going to affect our portfolio long term. I just want to take a quick little 30 second break and then we'll get Barry back into it. Does that sound good? Mm-hmm. Okay, we'll be right back. Ready to open the door to financial success with smart real estate investments? At Calvin Realty, they understand the power of smart investments. Whether you're a seasoned investor or just getting started, their team is there to guide you every step of the way. Picture this. Great locations, cash flow, and a portfolio tailored to your financial goals. Calvin Realty specializes in identifying great opportunities, turning your investment goals into reality. Say goodbye to guessing whether your next step is the right one. Smart moves, smart investments, Calvin Realty. Abraham. (laughs) Um, Okay, we are back. And into the refinance. Uh, How many of you guys know what a refinance is? I didn't even think about that. Should I explain it? Uh, Like 30 second explanation, I think. Okay, because the refinance, I feel like I'm going to explain this. And then um, did you just put a thumbs up in the chat? A hand up. I know. Did you just engage in the chat to say that I know rather than there's a microphone right in front of you? I I was encouraging people to let us know, Wayne. Or were you just waving at Kyler because he came in the studio? (laughs) Hi, Kyler. Um, Okay. So I want everyone to know that uh, I didn't understand refinance, what refinance was for a very long time. I understood the concept of it. I understood well, actually, I barely understood the concept. Let's just be honest. And I, I just want to want to show vulnerability that I didn't quite get it on what it was because I didn't, for a long time, I didn't quite understand what equity was. I didn't quite understand the difference. Like, be, I didn't know how much was left on my mortgage. I didn't know what my property was worth. And I didn't understand what a mortgage actually truly was and how it was physically, um, what it was physically. And what a caveat was on title, for, for those of you guys in Alberta, or a lean on title, um, I didn't understand how it all worked. So when someone said refinance the property and pull your money out, I just didn't understand the mechanics of it. Mm-hmm. And so we all, when we purchase a property and we, we get it with a mortgage, you know, we buy a, a $500,000 property and we put $100,000 down, uh, we would get a $400,000 mortgage to cover the difference, right? That $400,000 mortgage gets added onto the title of your property in the form of a lien. And it stops you from selling the property without clearing that lien first. So it's almost like you put the piece of paper on your front door of your property. And if you want to sell your, your property or do any, or, or whatever, if you want to sell your property, you can't sell the property until you take that piece of paper off the front door. Okay. Does that make sense? So that piece of paper is your mortgage document that you sign. It says, hey, hey, you can't sell this house until you pay me back the $400,000 that you owe me. Let's plop here on the front door. So in order for you to sell that house, you need to pay the bank back the $400,000 that you owe them. But of course, every month you make a mortgage payment. Some of that mortgage payment goes towards paying down down the loan and some of it goes towards interest. So in a simple example, let's say you make a $1,000 payment, which is not a thousand, it's $2,000 payment. $1,000 $1,000 goes towards interest and $1,000 goes towards the principal. So every month you make a payment, $1,000 goes towards paying down that $400,000 loan. So every month it goes three ninety nine, three ninety eight, three ninety seven, three ninety six, dollars right? Yeah. That's the simple, easy way of looking at it. So when you go to sell that property, you go to the front door and look at that piece of paper and it says that 
you owe $351,000 or $350,000. In order for you to sell that house, you have to pay the bank back what you owe them. So at that particular month, that date, you owe them $350,000, okay? I say this because if you're going to refinance a property as well, in order to refinance, basically what you're saying is, I have this house. I don't want this mortgage anymore. I know I still owe $350,000, but I want to pay out that old mortgage and I want to put a new mortgage on. And it could be with the same bank. It could be with a different bank. It doesn't really matter. But you're saying, I no longer want to continue with this loan agreement that I have, this mortgage agreement that I have with this bank. And I want to refinance this property. So in order to do that, you need to pay the original bank back the loan or the mortgage that you owe them. So you have to pay them back the $350,000. But when the, the mechanics of how a refinance works is that you would go to, let's just say for easy sake, your, your original mortgage is with TD Canada Trust. You're, what you're going to do for easy sake, it, I don't want to overcomplicate this. You're going to go over to RBC the Royal Bank of Canada, and you're going to say, hi, RBC, I would like to refinance my property. And they say, okay, cool. So you already have an existing mortgage? And you say, yes. And they say, okay, how much is that mortgage? How much is left on it? And you say $350,000. They go, okay, cool. And how much is your property worth? And you say, well, it's probably somewhere a little over $500,000. Okay, okay, okay. So what we're going to do, RBC, what we're going to do is we are going to get an appraisal on the property. We're going to determine what the actual value of this property is. And then we will lend you up to 80% of the value of that property. We want to make sure that you still have a little bit of skin in the game. We want to make sure that you keep 20% of your equity in there. But we will give you a mortgage of up to 80% of the value of your property. Okay. So RBC orders an appraisal. They determine that the value of the property is $500,000. All right. In that case, they say, okay, as we said, we will give you up to 80% of $500,000. So we will give you, we can, we can give you up to $400,000. Do you want a mortgage of $400,000, Wayne? And I say, yes, that would be lovely. Or I say, actually, to be honest with you, I only want $350,000. I can say whatever I want. But the mortgage that I get has to be enough to pay out my old mortgage that's stuck to the front door, remember. So I can't say I want a $200,000 mortgage because if they gave me two hundred, dollars that's not enough to pay back the $350,000 mortgage that's stuck on the front door. I have to pay off the old one first. So what I'm actually going to do is because the purpose of why I'm doing this is because I want to pull some equity out. I'm going to say, yes, I would like up to 80% the $400,000 mortgage, please. So what they're going to do is they're going to say, okay, cool, sign all these documents. And then the 400000 it's a new mortgage document, right? Yeah. In order for them to put that new $400,000 mortgage document on my front door, they need to pay out the first one first. They need to remove the first one. So the $400,000 is going to come through my lawyer's office. My lawyer is going to take the $400,000. They're going to pay TD Canada Trust the $350,000, which is owed to them. We're going to pull down that mortgage document from my front door and we're going to put the new $400,000 mortgage document with RBC on there. Does that make sense? Yeah. I hope it makes sense. You had your hand up sorry, already, so I, I think you already understand. But I, just, I want to go through <laughs> no, a very visually... Really well. yeah. Sorry? I think you explained it really well. Yes. So remember, my lawyer got $400,000 from RBC. They took $350,000 of that and paid it back to TD Canada Trust to remove the old mortgage. My lawyer still has $50,000 in the, the account. What they're gonna do is they're gonna cut me a check for $50,000. Now I have access to that $50,000. So I no longer have a $350,000 mortgage with TD. I have a new mortgage with RBC for $400,000, okay? And I was able to get $50,000 of my equity out, which I can take and reinvest into something else. Boats and hose. Boats and hose. <laughs> now, I want you guys to realize the difference, though, between my original TD mortgage and my new RBC mortgage is the amount is, I will answer your question in a second, David. The amount is more now. So you have to take into consideration the fact that my mortgage before 
Actually, this is interesting. It'll actually be the same in this example. I, I don't want to overcomplicate things. Mm -hmm. You do have to keep in mind that when you refinance, your mortgage might be more than what it was before. So my original mortgage, when I bought it and I used TD Canada Trust, I put 20% down and I had a $400,000 mortgage. So my payments were $2,000 a month. My new mortgage with RBC is a new mortgage at $400,000. As long as my interest rates are the same as when they were when I bought it with TD, the mortgage payment will be exactly the same, $2,000. However, if the numbers were any different, like perhaps instead my appraisal came in at say $800,000, and they offer me 640 because 80% of 800,000 is 640 and I paid out my $350,000 mortgage and my lawyer cut me a check for $290,000. Keep in mind my $640,000 mortgage is significantly higher than my $400,000 mortgage. And in that case, I was able to get a lot more money out. However, my mortgage payment is going to be significantly more because on that money that I'm pulling out on that equity that I'm pulling out and tacking onto my mortgage, I'm paying interest on that. I'm paying mortgage payments on that every month. I have increased the amount to which I'm borrowing and my mortgage payment will go up now, which is fine. As long as I, the money that I'm pulling out, whether it be the 50,000 or the 290,000, as long as I'm pulling that money out and I'm going to use it to make money, that's totally fine. But everybody has to realize when you pull money out, when you pull equity out of your properties, when you do a refinance or a HELOC, you are going to be paying interest on that. And there are going to be payments. And today's payments are like six or 7% interest. So keep in mind that if I'm borrowing $50,000, I'm going to pay approximately $3,000 a year on that. If you're wondering how I got that, I just multiplied it by 0 0.06. 50,000 times 0 0.06, six percent interest, very simple. That's simple interest. It's not, it's, obviously we're not, I'm not gonna do the math for semi-compounded interest, I know. But that's gonna be my cost, approximately. And that $3,000 divided by 12, Gabby, 12 months, is $250 a month. So that's my interest costs for borrowing that money is $250 a month approximately. I better be making at least $250 a month or $3,000 a year off of that money that I, that I borrowed mm -hmm. to cover the cost of borrowing it. Plus, I better be making something on top of it, mm -hmm. right? So boats and hoes is a terrible idea. Mm -hmm. Don't invest in boats and hoes because um, boats and hoes are depreciating assets. That was a terrible joke. <laughs> both. Both are. <laughs> I can't believe I just said hose or depreciating assets. <laughs> and we'll cut that one out. Okay. So now I got 12, maybe 11 minutes to explain what, now that you have a good understanding of, of, of what's going on. Um, Obi-Wan asked, uh, do you pay any penalty fees to TD? I only pay penalties or fees to TD, the original mortgage, if... I failed to adhere to any of my obligations in my original mortgage contract. So if I was in the middle of a five-year term, a fixed five-year term, and I canceled it at the two-year mark, then I would have about three years worth of fees that are going to be, I'm going to be responsible for. And they're going to calculate that, that on their end. It's called the interest rate differential formula. I'm not going to get into that today. It's too complicated for the amount of time I have. But yes, there would be fees. You're also going to pay legal fees because you've got to pay your lawyer to do it. So you're going to pay your lawyer about 1500 bucks as well. Um, now, the other question that came in is, can I extend my the amortization out to 30 if I was at a 25-year amortization? Yes. So if I was originally on a 25-year amortization, a 25-year mortgage loan with a five-year fixed term, when you refinance, as long as you 
have 20% equity left in the deal, as long as you're not going above 80% loan to value, you can extend to 30 years. Yes. It, it's a new mortgage. It's, it's as a if, brand new like mortgage. It's as if you were going to purchase the property and they were giving you a mortgage. Yeah. yeah. It's a brand new mortgage. Yeah. So yes, you can extend that as well, which is, which is very good. Um, and Fritz, I, I see your question there about second mortgages and HELOCs, and I'm just going to save that one for tomorrow, if that's okay, because that's just a, it's a different topic, and I, I want to make sure that we get into that without distracting everybody on this particular topic. Um, but it's a great question, terrific question. I'm trying to save it. My computer's slow. So everybody's got a good understanding of how this all works now. Yeah? Is yeah, there anyone yeah, confused? Yeah, there's a lot of, uh, of comments saying about how good of an explanation it was. Okay, perfect, perfect. Yeah. Because um, I'm trying my best here because... Can anyone hear me struggling? <laughs> <laughs> Try to copy it again. With my computer right now, it's like click, click, click. There we go. It worked now. Okay. The reason why I put so much effort into that and the reason why I talk so slowly was because I, as I explained earlier, had so much fucking trouble wrapping my head around this. Mm -hmm. And I'm a pretty smart guy. I think I'm a pretty smart guy. And I took a lot of pride in my math skills as a child. As I get older, I'm, I'm, I'm struggling a little bit more, I'm finding. But I couldn't seem to wrap my head around how much money can I get out and how much is it going to cost me afterwards? And so now you guys got an understanding of this. Um, we got two properties um, that we're exploring, actually potentially more, but there's two that I'm looking at for sure. One of which we are in the process, the, the applications and our joint venture partners are, are putting through the, uh, the application right now um, for the refinance. And we bought this property last year and it was one of the examples um, that I posted about yesterday. It was the, I believe it was the property that went up like 91%. Um, sorry, we got like a 91% ROI on the investment just in, in less than one year. So we bought this property at, for a certain price last year, and then it appreciated a significant amount. Um, and our joint venture partners, uh, we only put it on a one year fixed term because the interest rates were high and we wanted to see what was going on with interest rates. So that was just a strategic move on our part. Um, but now we're coming up on the end of the mortgage term. I believe it's this month. Yes. So we're cutting her close. And we're just waiting, waiting to see if interest rates were going to drop in the first quarter. And they didn't. So we decided that we're going to take a three-year fixed term or two, three or two. I think we're going three. Um, but our joint venture partners asked, you know, since it's such an increase in, in value, is it possible that we could refinance and pull some of our money, our investment back out? Because our partners borrowed it on their HELOC, their home equity line of credit, to which they're paying interest on. So the, ideally, they would like to reduce that amount that's on the HELOC if possible. And my goal is, at, at least for my joint ventures, as a joint venture partner, as a money partner, sorry, as the, as the expert, what I want is I want to get my investors their money back as quickly as possible. And that's not to buy them out. It's to give them their money back and they can still keep their 50% stake in, in the property. My first goal, well, this is my, my second goal. My first goal is to make sure that this thing runs well and it cash flows and I never have to ask them for money. My second goal is to get them their original investment contribution back as quickly as possible. So we ran the numbers and based on the, um, the appreciation, uh, we determined that we got an appraisal. We determined what the value was going to be. And if we were to refinance at the appraised value, and get the full 80% mortgage, we would be able to give them back half of their original down payment. So half of their investment, which is fucking phenomenal in one year. Mm -hmm. I look like a genius. <laughs> I'm not taking total credit for it. I did see, I did see a lot of opportunities and I knew that this was going to happen, but you don't make any promises when it comes to stuff like this. I would never ever say like, I'll get your half of your money back in a year. Um, but I saw the opportunity there last year and that's why I shared that post yesterday. I'm like, I fucking saw it coming and I knew it was going to happen. And I know that there's going to be many other very, very happy joint venture partners of ours in the coming years as well, because our other properties are doing really well as well. But um, again, I got to take all these things into consideration, everything I just talked about. But what I told these joint venture partners um, that want to do the refinance is that 
I'm cool with this, but I need to spend about a week just running through some numbers. And I also want to wait until the very last fucking minute. Because I told you, it, the our original one-year mortgage term ends in like 16 days. I want to wait and see what happens with the rents first. Because if we're going to increase this mortgage amount, because our mortgage will be going up, mm-hmm. the, the, the mortgage amount will be going up. If I increase it, what's the interest rate going to be if we lock in? Also, I need to see what the rents are going to be because we're in, a, we're in a high interest market right now. And though it's a cash flowing property and though we put lots of money away, it's still tight it, with these interest rates. And what I don't want to do is increase our mortgage payments and decrease our cash flow, which would increase our risk. So it's not, in my opinion, it's not worth it to pull that money out for you if it means that this property is going to be at high risk. Yeah. Because I'm just going to be asking you for money in six months when something happens, right? Yeah. If rents go down or if, you know, there's a huge repair or something like that, which there won't be, but I don't ever want to be in that position. So I always make sure that I mitigate my risk as much as possible. I want to reduce them to the as close to zero as possible. But after doing the math, we, we determined that because the interest rates went down slightly and because we're going with a three-year fix as opposed to a one-year fix, it actually reduced the interest quite a bit. Mm-hmm. And by refinancing at the new appraised value, 80% of the new appraised value, we with a with a with a higher mortgage but a lower interest rate, we are actually a, in a position where our mortgage payments are thirty dollars less than what they were before. So we're able to pull out half their money, which in this case was something close to like thirty thousand dollars, and our mortgage payments are reduced by thirty bucks, which means our cash flow is increasing by thirty bucks. So it's a terrific it's a terrific situation. Amazing, Absolutely very amazing. amazing. Yeah. And our joint venture partners are extremely happy with this as well. We're happy with this. Um, I'm sure some of you guys are thinking, well, why does the why does the joint venture partners, why do the money partners get their money back and not, wouldn't you normally split that? That there is negotiable. And whenever you do a refinancing, you want to pull equity out. Um, it's negotiable and it's a case by case for whatever you guys want to do with your joint ventures. But for me, I don't like taking half of that equity because first and foremost, I want to make sure my joint venture partner gets their all their money back first. In most cases, when our joint venture partners get their money back, they just want to reinvest it. Now, this is not the case for these partners, but it's the honorable thing to do. They're the ones that brought the money. They get their money back first. That's how I play. I don't need this money right now. The money that I make from these deals is going to be the little bit of cash flow that I get every month, which, I don't, again, I don't even use, and the money at the very end when I sell. Maybe in 10 years from now, we refinance and we pull some of our equity out tax-free and I you know, I put it into an account. But I look at my rental properties as a long-term investment and I'm not expecting any money from them right now. My active businesses support our lifestyle and our bills. Our rental properties are just for building long-term wealth. So joint venture partners are very happy. They get half their money out. There's a very good chance at the end of the, the next three-year mortgage term, they're going to get the rest of theirs out. Um, but that's one example there. And I think it's pretty fantastic. Absolutely. Yeah. It's, it's an incredible situation to be in. Like, I think that this is the coolest refinance that we've been able to do considering it's been one year. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. And, and it's, it's different for us because the market that we've been in has not supported a a, a move like this in the past. No, this is unheard of as far as, as long as we've been investing. Yeah. You can't do this. (laughs) Right. And, but take careful consideration in, in when you're doing something like this, as we did, I, th- I said, you know what? Absolutely. This is fantastic. I just want to run the numbers first. And I just want to wait two more months. I know it's going to be cutting a little close. I want to wait two more months and see what the rents are first, because if rents go down or the rental demand goes down, I don't want to be in a position where, you know, cause the, the lease is coming up for renewal in July. Mm-hmm. I need to know what I'm going to be able to charge mm-hmm. in July. Mm-hmm. And I don't want to be in a position where I, I have to accept one hundred or two hundred dollars less in rent, which means that now we're you know in a less cash flow, which means higher risk. So I wanted to make sure we're in a good position first, and I think I hope that they they respected that. I hope they respected the fact that I don't want to put additional risk on just to give you your money back. Yeah, 
right? I need this thing to succeed. But at the same time, my second priority is to get your money back first. So um, the other example that we're looking at right now, this one here, we've got um, a little over a year left on the mortgage term. Um, and this one, I'm considering doing a refinance, but there's two other things that I'm watching for. And I'll, I'll wrap this up really quickly here because I know that uh, we're just a little over the hour mark now. But this property here has gone up significantly in value. And I've got a handful of properties that have gone up significantly, but some of them are still, we're, we're stuck in mortgage terms and the cost to break those mortgage terms or that mortgage is going to cost me a hefty penalty like someone was mentioning before. And it's not worth paying a big penalty to get equity out. Not unless I really need it and I can see the, the value. Um, but there's one that's a little over a year and I've been looking into seeing what the penalty would be on that. Because if I refinance that property, I'd be able to pull all of our initial investment out plus $100,000. Damn. That one is worth considering. And I want to see what that penalty is going to be. Because I assume the penalty is going to be something like five grand or something like that. But I want to add that into my analysis of what the cost of getting that money is going to be by pulling out that equity, the original down payment plus the hundred thousand dollars. Keep in mind, I'm going to be paying interest on that. Plus I have to tack on whatever the cost of that interest is plus the $5,000 penalty that will increase my cost of borrowing, right? Mm -hmm. Then I need to take into consideration, will this property still cash flow afterwards? And if it does cash flow, will it cash flow enough that I'm comfortable taking on that additional risk in order to access these funds to reinvest in other projects? And that's where I'm kind of on the fence right now. I don't know. I'm in no rush. I don't need the money. See, for some individuals, if you're just getting started, I mean, having access to two, three hundred thousand dollars is is a pretty, you know, significant amount of money where you can, you know, buy your next three, four or five properties or maybe more depending on your market and your property. But for us, we don't need it, need it. So I'm not going to pull out money and pay interest on it if it's just going to be sitting in an account or if it's just going to be allocated towards something that doesn't really provide as much value in our life. Mm -hmm. So I'm taking, I'm taking careful consideration with it and I'm, I'm waiting to see how we want to handle this. But there's, there's quite a bit of equity available. Um, I was doing, I didn't get through all the properties yesterday, but I just the notable ones, the ones that I thought for sure that went up in value. And I was brushing my teeth and um, I was typing in, <laughs> literally, I had I had my phone on its stand and I'm brushing my teeth and, and you know, Gabby's blow drying her hair or something like that. And I'm like, this one over here went up this much. <laughs> and she's like, what? <laughs> it's, uh, it's crazy because, you know, we've, we, like I mentioned yesterday, we've been in such a flat market for so long where like our whole business model, our whole business plan was based off of buying good businesses. And I say good business, I mean good rental property businesses. These rental properties have been performing so well that I didn't even care that if they went up in value or down in value, as long as they performed well and they cash flowed well and they were paying down the mortgage. And because I knew over time, eventually they would all go up in value as well, which is, which is the dessert, right? after the entrees. And I'm so incredibly happy to see that the values are going up because it's, in, it, it's, 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 it's fun to watch. It's fun to watch. We're talking about millions of dollars in increased net worth, just like in a matter of six months. It's absolutely bonkers. Um, very cool feeling. Now it's just, now as we come into this new cycle and as the, you know, these new opportunities are presenting themselves, now it's, it's time to determine, do I pull it out or do I just leave it there? You know, we have a really good, solid portfolio that cash flows really well. That's very low risk. We don't need to pull it out. And sometimes not pulling it out is the right decision. And yes, there's some debt equity in there that's not making any money. But keep in mind that debt equity is supporting. That debt equity is supporting our cash flowing assets is is the reason why our rental properties are performing so well. And it's not always about scaling and multiplying and the compound effect 
Sometimes it's about keeping some of that equity in there, though you're not getting the best return on your equity. You're supporting your portfolio and keeping it at a, at a low, modest level of risk so that you can continue on and you don't, you don't have to worry at night whether the rents go up, or sorry, down or the interest rates go up. So lots to take into consideration, but I hope all this kind of helps you guys have a better understanding of how to, well, one, how to scale your portfolio, two, how to maintain a portfolio with low risk, and then uh, three, how a refinance works. Pretty awesome. All right. That wraps up today's show. Thank you guys so much for staying a little over the one hour and uh, I had a lot of fun. And if you guys have any more questions about this or anything else, make sure to join us back tomorrow morning on Friday at 6 a.m. Uh, on that Podbean app and, uh, and bring your questions and we'll answer them for you. We'll see you then. Bye. Thanks for listening to the Real Estate Investing Morning Show. Looking for more guidance and coaching? The REI Master's Mentorship Program might be what you're looking for. For more information, email info at reimasters.ca.